Thank you. Thank you, Ellie. Uh, kids can make their way to Children's Church right now, and that's four-year-old to fourth grade. They're welcome to stay in here. If you've got kids with you, they're, they're fine in here, but they just usually have more fun down there. Um, we're going to continue our series with Joshua next week, <clears throat> and it's Jericho, and it's going to be worth just for point one next week. And next week is um, uh, dispelling the myths of Jericho is the first part of that. So you're not going to want to miss that. That's next week. Kids are making their way. I love it. Oh, these are some VBS faces. Absolutely. Hey, buddy. Good to see you again. You all right? All right. I'm glad you're here. That is great. Um, but because today we have a special treat for you. It's Mike and Agnieszka, uh, missionaries to Poland. It's been a few years since we've seen you. So uh, this is a real treat for us. Mike's educated at Asbury, as well as Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, working on a doctorate right now, actually, as well. And early on in ministry, uh, while you're at Asbury, a couple short-term trips to Poland? Uh, no. At, while you're in your master's, okay. And he was scoping out Poland. So he married his dear wife, who was, uh, who was from Poland. That's what he was scoping out while he was there. And so that's successful ministry going on. And, uh, and she's really as amazing as he is. Uh, evangelistic conferences, Bible teaching, actually working with translation work as well, which is fantastic. They're doing uh, developing cult Christian culture in Poland as well as churches and uh, in evangelistic efforts. It's a real pleasure to hear uh, Mike Green with us today. So come on up and why don't you give him a warm welcome back to Abundant Life. Glad you're here. Blessings. Yeah, it has been a long time since we were here. Uh, let's see, let me put this, pop this up. Okay, and turn this on too. Okay. All right. Um, you know, over the years, uh, this, this month actually counts for my be living in Poland for 33 years. Um, next year, I turn 60. Actually, when the women are going to have your movie night <laughs> will be my 60th birthday. And so now our, our thoughts are getting closer and closer 10 years down the road when we actually are able to retire. Um, but you know, throughout all these years, um, you guys, or for a lot of those years, you guys have partnered with us as a church. And I have to say, um, I realized that things got dark for you as a church at a certain point in time. And the thing that really touches my heart is your faithfulness to us in continuing to support uh, us as, as your missionaries. So we thank you for that. But at the same time, um, just to give you a broader picture of what we've been able to do together. Um, we were able to plant, uh, we have been able to plant three churches, one among uh, Polish people and two among um, Polish gypsies. Um, there are actually, that church is now in, started in Poland, but now it's in England. Um, because they all moved to England. <laughs> but the other thing, uh, Agieszka helped to start the very first um, Protestant uh, Christian school in Krakow. Um, I helped to start a uh, first school dedicated to preparing Polish missionaries. She's translated a songbook in her last week or a couple weeks ago, her um, uh, material for third graders came out and you can buy that now. So, you know, together, we've been able to do uh, quite a bit. And, and um, let's see, am I pressing this right? Or is it down? Oh, oh now it's not working. Oh, it's not working. Well, somebody from the back, somebody from the back is going to have to, because before the service it was working. Now it's not, so I don't know. Okay. Oh, 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 oh. Uh, well, it was working. All right. Somebody will have to push it back. Uh, but anyway, and 
You know, this, uh, throughout all these years that Agnieszka and I have been uh, serving in Poland, these past five years had to be the strangest for us and also had dark times uh, within them. Because, you know, first we had uh, COVID, um, just like you guys did, and then, um, unlike you guys, we had the Russians coming into Ukraine. And that totally changed how we were living and in, in, in ministering. Um, and it, it made me think, is this going to work or no? No. Oh, no, it went back. Okay, there we go. Okay, so <clears throat> Paul says in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, he says, But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. And I think we all saw during COVID um, weakness in dealing with life, in dealing with society, and all the different things that the government was doing and whatnot. But even more so, we saw that grace abound more and more. Um, when Ukrainians were coming into Poland. I mean, we had five million people come. Now, you guys living in the States, that may not seem like anything. But for us, I mean, you have to remember, Poland is the size of New Mexico or Arizona. Uh, we have a population of 38 million people. Uh, so it's much smaller. So when you get five million people come through, you, you really feel it. And <clears throat> this text... Um, when the New Testament talks about grace, I kind of think uh, it hearkened, grace harkens back to God's loving kindness or hesed in the Old Testament. And it's interesting because I think um, what really changed my thinking was the book of Ruth. Because you see God's loving kindness act, acting through Ruth, who leaves her own culture to go with her mother-in-law of all people back to Israel, you know, and helps her. And when you think about loving kindness, there's three elements that are, are really important um, in that loving kindness happens typically, not always, but typically through relationship. You know, in the Old Testament, we're talking about, you know, the covenant relationship uh, that God had with Israel. But secondly, it's, t it's always... Um, like God's loving kindness is always about God or somebody who wants to express that loving kindness, doing so through doing something concrete. It's not just, uh, oh, I wish you well type of thing. It's showing them help. Like, for example, you remember after Saul and his family was killed, there was still one family member that, from Paul, Saul's family that David wanted to help. Okay, and so he gave him that concrete uh, love. Um, and then you see it also with the coming of Christ. I mean, he just didn't come to heaven and was on a throne and saying, you know, I'm blessing everybody. You know, he went out, he did things, um, he taught people, he feeded the 5,000, uh, he healed people, he healed them from demon possession as well. Christ did concrete things to help people. And then uh, lastly, typically when, when, in, when we're talking about uh, God's loving kindness in the Old Testament of Hesed, we're talking about something of typically somebody who is, has, who is stronger is helping somebody who is weaker. And that's what we saw during COVID and when uh, Ukrainians were coming in, into Poland. And so let me go on and um, let's see, is this right? Okay, now it's not working. Okay, we have, we have some problems. Oh, well. Oh, 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 okay. Too far, too far. Okay, okay, that's, that's good. And so for us, just like for you, I mean, COVID was a really strange time. I mean, uh, in Poland, the government said, uh, especially that first that first year back in 220, 
uh, the government said that only a certain amount of people can be allowed in supermarkets. And so you would see these long lines going all the way around the supermarket building of people waiting to get in line to buy their groceries. And in fact, um, during Easter, the supermarket said, well, because of the situation, we will stay open 24 hours a day. People can come and buy whenever they want. And so that brought Agnieszka and I, uh, we didn't want to stand in long lines during the day, so we actually went grocery shopping at 2 o'clock in the morning, not only for us, but also for Agnieszka's aging parents. Um, and back then, there was only five people standing in line, so we got in pretty quick. Um, but during COVID, um, it was also the time when I decided to go back to school, and I thought, well, since this is COVID, what I will study will be the effects of the pandemic on Christian values of community. And so I just finished this year, I just finished studying four different churches and I'd like to share with you about one of those churches. You can go to the next slide. Um, and this church is up in Northern Poland. And so what I did, um, I had interviews with people and I asked them, okay, so what was your church community like before the pandemic? And I remember uh, talking with the pastor, and he said, and this pastor had actually grown up in this church, okay? Uh, and he said, Mike, when he got back uh, to his home church, he said the people absolutely hated each other. Um, how often do you have your church business meetings? Quarterly. Quarterly, okay. They were having their business meetings every other week. Okay, and they were recording them in the sense of something really negative saying, okay, see, this is what you said. And so it was a really bad atmosphere. And they had also just back in 2014, the pastor started his ministry in 2016. In 2014, um, they had received back from the government the church building. So now it was all there because during socialism, uh, the government came in and they took over property, especially after World War II, and they divided up buildings so that people would have a place to live because there was a lot of housing during World War II that was destroyed, okay? But it wasn't until 2016 that they got the property back and it needed to be totally overhauled. And the pastor knew that in order to do this, that he needed to unite the people. And so he went around and talked with each of the members and he said, okay, either you can forgive each other and we can go forward or you can stay in the past. For those people who wanted to stay in the past, they left the church, okay? And then the pastor decided, well, there's a group of people who left and started up a second denomination, a second church in the same denomination. He said, we need to be reunited with them, or at least um, we need to have some reconciliation. And once again, um, the people who did not want to reconcile with this other church, they left the church. And so right before the pandemic, there were only 30 people going to the church, okay? Uh, and so what I saw as the value before COVID was going forward. The church wanted to change directions. They wanted to go forward. And the way they did that was by, one, forgiving each other and by reconciliation, okay? So how did COVID impact uh, their values? Uh, during the pandemic, uh, it was kind of a combination of a couple of things. The pastor gave very timely and practical sermons one of the sermons he talked about, because in Poland, like here in the States, there were many theories going around about the pandemic, about, you know, government involvement and everything like this, and about the, the vaccinations and everything. And he said, you know, the most important thing is that we love our neighbors and we will show respect for each other. And it's interesting because in my interview, I was able to see in the people from the pew that they were actually applying his sermons to their lives in the church. And so, for example, one guy uh, told me, he said, you know, I think 
during the pandemic, we needed to have what he called a space of freedom. And what that meant is that, okay, if you came to church and you wanted to practice distancing and wearing the mask, you could do that. But, for example, in his case, he didn't like wearing a mask and so he wouldn't. Um, and so they created this space of freedom to where, okay, you could do what you wanted based upon your conscience. The pastor had another sermon where he talked about, um, uh, let's see, oh man, I'm getting older. I, mean, I just forgot it. Um, where he talked about, you know, how we deal, because a lot of uh, people in Poland were judging one another based upon whether they're abiding by the, the rules or were they not as far as like spiritually. It's like, well, if you're wearing a mask, you don't trust God to protect you. And he had another uh, a sermon that kind of emphasized that, okay, let's not confuse, let's not make physical um, decisions that we make about our own bodies related to spirituality because they're two separate things. And so the church during uh, the pandemic, it was the only church I studied. They did lose some people, but it was really the only church that grew, okay? And they grew um, in their values. Two uh, elderly women were saying, you know, after years of coming to the church, you know, it gets to be the same routine Sunday after Sunday. And COVID gave them a contrast. It's like, oh, we weren't able to go to church. And all of a sudden, coming back to church and hearing people pray or sing during the worship service, it was like something new again for them. Um, an uh, another woman told me uh, that, you know, it changed also the priorities and people's sensitivities. Before the pandemic, back when they still hated each other, uh, people would get irritated and offended very easily and would not, they'd get offended at church and then they wouldn't come to church for a couple months or a half a year or something like this. She said, well, because, you know, the real important things had gotten, you know, pressed upon or something like that, she said sarcastically. And it was interesting because during the pandemic, all of a sudden people, these things that people thought were really important before the pandemic, all of a sudden they weren't as important as they were, had been previously. All of a sudden it was more important that they maintain their unity. And you know, that was the interesting thing to me because I saw in this church what Paul talks about in Romans in chapter 14, in that um, the church isn't about eating. It's about righteousness and unity. And I could see in this church that it wasn't important for them who is right about, for example, the pandemic. The more important thing for them was that we're unified and we stay together. Um, it's kind of my hope in my research that, you know, different examples like that coming across culturally will also be an example for you as well in showing that, hey, look how God's grace worked through this church. I mean, even at an older church that has existed for many, many years, and God brought them and caused a revolution uh, in their own lives today, so that today this church is in a completely different place than it was before the pandemic. Um, let's see, let's go on to the next. Oh, it's working, okay. So on February of 2022, Agnieszka and I woke up to the news that uh, Russia had invaded Ukraine. And all of a sudden, we started, Poland started to get an influx of, of Ukrainians uh, into Poland. And on, the, on your left-hand side, that's the picture in Lvov, which is a train station in uh, Ukraine. It's one of the closest cities to the bo uh, Polish border. And then the other picture on your right is what the train station looked like in Poland. And uh, in Krakow, excuse me. And the interesting thing, um, I had always heard um, from Polish people, they said, you know, we fight with each other all the time. I mean, there's a saying where you have two poles, you have three opinions, okay? 
And, um, but the only, they said the only time we unify is in a time of crisis. And I thank God because I was able to see that with my own eyes. Literally overnight, nobody was talking about COVID whatsoever. You didn't see it on social media any place. COVID was the pandemic for all intensive purposes for Poland was ended, had ended because everybody was focused and unified. What can we do to help the Ukrainians? I mean, people were coming to train stations and saying, you can come and stay with us. There's one woman, uh, Agnieszka and I attend an international church now with many Africans, and there was one African girl living in Ukraine. She had just gotten there to study, and then all of a sudden the war breaks out, and so she follows everybody else into Poland. And at the train station, this guy offered um, to have her stay in his house. And you know, she was kind of thinking, okay, who is this guy really? Is he gonna do something to me? And he had invited a couple other women also to stay in his house. Turns out he and his wife are Christians. And <clears throat> they actually, this couple actually became her adopted parents in Poland. Um, so, but just, you know, stories, stories like that uh, happening um, and seeing God's grace. You know, sometimes God touches us ourselves with his grace. But you know, sometimes he wants to use his grace through us to touch other people. And I'd like to invite my wife to come up and share more about that. So now it's my time to play the game with slides. <laughs> Let's see. No. Okay, it's working. Um, yeah, so uh, like Mike said, we woke up one day in the morning in February 2022, and suddenly the life was a little different or a lot different. We, as Pauls, we felt overwhelmed, uh, and we didn't know what's going to happen next day or next week or next month. But can you imagine all those people who came to our city, to our country, who are even more overwhelmed and even more uncertain of um, what the future would bring? So in a situation like that, there is no time to make plans and make um, complicated uh, outreach um, ways. Uh, you just kind of react to the basic needs. And what was the basic need, the most immediate need of those people who we encountered? It was to find a shelter, and Mike told you what was happening. Uh, but also they were hungry, they were cold. So um, two ladies in Krakow, who I don't think they're Christians, uh, actually I think they're quite far from the church and God, uh, but they have very tender hearts. They came with the idea to ask people that live in Krakow to cook soups and then put them in um, glass jars and maybe bring them to one spot in the city where all the refugees who are hungry, who need something to eat, could come and just get whatever they wanted. And. Uh, the moment I learned about this initiative, I thought, oh, that will be a place for me to serve. So I was uh, helping at the distribution center for uh, several months, and we got this um, kind of uh, small room in a very wear down, uh, wear down uh, building in Krakow. But it was a good place. It was a place where anybody who needed help could come. And one of the symbols of the welcoming spirit in our place was that the door to the room or to the building were always open. Even though it was kind of cold in February, we never closed the door. They were always open. Nobody had to knock on the door to come in. And people uh, in Krakow responded beautifully uh, we would receive every day over 1,000 liters of soups, different soups, and that's about 250 gallons. Uh, and I remember um, some people who would actually show up every day bringing something. I remember this young girl, and she lived on the other side of the city, and it's a pretty large city. 
uh, and every day she would jump on her uh, bicycle and come to our place and bring a couple jars of soaps and her backpack. And I also remember this old gentleman, and every day at the same time, every day he would show up, uh, pulling little shopping cart behind him, and in the shopping cart there were a couple jars of soaps that his wife uh, would make every day in their little kitchen, in their little apartment. So there was a lot of moving moments for me, meeting with Polish people wanting to help, but also there was a lot of moving moments um, meeting the refugees. Um, of course, all of us uh, who were serving there, we did not speak Ukrainian. I'm still kind of trying to change slide. Um, so, so we couldn't talk with the people, but I would pray over every jar of soup uh, that I would receive or I would give, hoping that through that, the simple act of uh, helping, God would bring peace uh, to those who needed the peace the most at this time. Uh, we also uh, would send um, a lot of the soups every day to the train station. So the people who were just um, getting out of the trains and stopped just for a little bit could get something to eat. We would also send, send, so, or, <laughs> Okay, we would send a lot of, um, of the soups to other places who were hosting, um, hosting refugees, larger group of refugees, and we would also uh, send the soups to the border and even behind. And on the picture you can see some of the soldiers in Ukraine who actually received some of our soups made in Krakow just for them. But pretty soon we learned that soups uh, is not enough, that the need is much greater. So uh, once the money started coming, uh, pretty much every day somebody would go to a large grocery store to buy some basic groceries. And we would spend around $2,000 every day. Um, like I said, the need was so great that uh, after, I don't know, two, three hours, of bringing the stuff in the distribution center, everything was gone. Um, on the one hand, you might think, well, it, it wasn't a big ministry, right? It was just making soups and, and giving the soups to those who were hungry. But I was thinking and hoping that through my prayers over every jar, through my prayers over those people who I encountered there, um, one day they would go back to what happened, to what happened to them. They would see uh, that it wasn't only us Pauls being nice to them, but actually it was God who was showing his grace to them through us. And uh, every Sunday when we speak at the church, different churches, I see this boy's face and Every Sunday I'm thinking, I just hope that he will remember what happened to him and his family, and that he won't remember when he'll be adult and, I don't know, 10, 20 years, only the, the bad things, the horrible things that happened, but he will remember that God did take care of them <laughs> through different people, different organizations, but it was God. It wasn't us people. It was God, and that he will thank him. Uh, well, after several months of um, serving at the distribution center for soup for Ukraine, my back said, okay, that's enough. There was a lot of heavy lifting that I had to do, and I could not help them anymore. But uh, I really wanted to kind of stay in this theme of helping those who are weaker at the moment that I am. So um, I joined this organization. It's, once again, it's not a Christian organization, but it has Christian roots. It's called Mali um, Bracia Ubogich in Polish. In English, it would be Little Brothers of the Poor. And the organization um, has been functioning for over 40 years. It was started right after uh, the war 
in France, and it has a couple chapters in the States. I know one is in Chicago, one is in Boston, and one is in UP in Michigan. But the whole idea of this organization is to uh, provide companionship uh, for elderly people who feel lonely. Uh, they don't necessarily have to be widows or widowers. Uh, they can have family, but you know, sometimes even when you're surrounded by people, you can be lonely among people, and you can be with family but still feel lonely. So we never ask what the situation is. That's enough that somebody needs um, a friend. And um, I really like the idea. And for the past, uh, okay, for the past year and a half, uh, I've been meeting with Pani Stasia, uh, Mrs. Stanislava. She is a widower, she's 83, um, and actually she is, she lives by herself, um, her, she got married uh, quite late in her life, so they never had kids, and basically everybody from her family lives in a different city or in different country. And uh, we meet every Tuesday, that's our day. I go to her apartment, and at first I thought, oh, maybe we'll be just watching TV, or I don't know, <laughs> uh, doing crossword puzzles, whatever. But uh, she doesn't want to watch TV with me. She wants to talk. So every moment just I cross the, uh, I, I get into the apartment, the TV is off, and uh, we start talking. Most of the time, she talks and I listen, and that's okay because I'm a good listener and I love stories uh, from people's life. Uh, but entering this program, I was really praying that um, God will create situations where I'll be able not only to talk about life in general, but talk about Christ, talk about God, talk about faith, talk about heaven and hell and all those things that really matter in life and in death. And um, at first, um, Pani Stasia was a little maybe reserved uh, to me, but one day I came to her and I saw that something is off, that she's a little nervous, something is not right. So I asked her what's going on. and. Uh, she said, oh, I just came from the doctor today and he told me that I might have a cancer. So I'm just, you know, afraid. And uh, my first reaction was, oh, can I pray for you? Pani Stasia said, yes, you can. And I think that she meant that I will go home and maybe in the evening I'll just say a short prayer for her. But I did something she did not, did, did not expect. I closed my eyes and I started praying out loud. And when I finished, um, I saw her uh, crying. And she whispered, nobody ever, meaning nobody ever did something like that for me. Nobody ever like that pray for, for me that way. And that was a, a point um, I miss this word, <laughs> uh, like a breaking point in our relationship. She really, really opened up. And uh, we had since that many great conversations, very deep conversations about spiritual issues. And she has questions. She, she asked me, what is the true faith? Uh, she wants to know what awaits her one day. What she's she can look forward to after she'll be gone from this earth so I'm really happy that not only God allowed me to bring some fun into her life and, and we have a lot of moments that we love and just do fun things too but that he also allowed me to share um, him with her and showed her his love and um, Please pray for her, and please pray for this relationship that I have with her. Uh, I, when I get back uh, pretty soon, actually next week, to Poland, I would like to be connected with another person um, like that. Uh, so um, 
I will be able to build another relationship with, with a lonely elderly person, and hopefully God will use me in showing his hazard to somebody else. So please pray for that too. I think uh, <clears throat> when I think about uh, God's loving kindness, about his hesed, about grace, it's a powerful thing. Um, and it works, um, it does, it works throughout our lives in helping us get through those difficult and dark times that uh, each of us experience. And at the same time, it's amazing how God can work through us, how God can even sometimes work through people who aren't even believers. Um, and, you know, when I think about uh, all the changes that have been happening um, in Poland, um, you know, there's a lot of people in Poland who think that, you know, maybe it's a great thing that we have the Ukrainians come over because the uh, evangelical church in Ukraine is much larger than the evangelical church in Poland. So they're hoping people are hoping out, well, maybe they'll help bring new life uh, to Polish churches. Um, but you know, on the other hand too, um, let's see, I gotta bring this up, okay. But the other hand too, I think uh, these difficult times also help us to think about our own lives as far as where it really is when push comes to shove. Where's my hope? One thing I saw in doing my, my research is that a lot of times we clarify what is really important to us, what our values are in crises. Okay? And <clears throat> Paul talks about that. You can switch the, to the next slide. He talks about his hope in, first, in 2 Corinthians 1, 8 through 10. And he says, For we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despised of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death, but that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us. On him we have set our hope that he will deliver us again. And you know, I discovered something for the first time, actually, as we were traveling uh, through different churches now. And I don't, when I grew up, and I would read about hope in the New Testament. I always thought, oh, they had such a vibrant hope, you know, that was totally fix, fixated on God and on Christ. And this scripture taught me that, okay, it wasn't, they didn't have a 100% hope in God, but it was a process that that hope grew and grew and deepened in their lives because Paul says, um, but that was his, his crisis in thinking that he was going to die, he said, was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. And all of a sudden it clicked. Okay, Paul didn't have that kind of hope either. He was going through a process of discovering that, okay, in this crisis, really, where is my hope? And I think, you know, as Poland goes uh, through many different changes, and as the United States is going through different changes, I think it helps us to wake up and to realize, okay, where is my hope? Is it in my family? Is it in my job? Is it in my country? And I think during these times of, of change, it causes us to question, it's like, okay, or is it really in Christ? Because really, Christ gives us the only true hope and future uh, that we have. And I'm hoping that um, today what we've shared, Agnieszka more kind of from the practical level, um, that you can begin to ask yourself, how does God want to work out his grace not only in your own life, but through you as a way of reaching out to 
your community here in Washington? What steps of showing God's grace in concrete actions can you show um, to be a, a testimony uh, to God and what he's doing and the power of the, the gospel to change lives, to radically change lives? You know, if God can do that in a church that was dead in Poland, that hated each other, to now where they actually love and have a reputation for loving each other, Think of what his grace can do through you guys. So I just pray that uh, God would continue to use you guys, that he would continue to build you. It's great to hear that your numbers are growing and that you guys have, uh, are having uh, uh, baptisms and everything. And we would pray that God's blessing would remain uh, on top of you. I'd ask that uh, maybe at the end, that not only would you pray for Agnieszka, she's flying back to Poland on Friday. It'll be her first time flying by herself, and she's kind of concerned, not so much the flying, but making all of the, she has three, um, oh, what do you call them? Eggs, exactly, connections to right, so that she would make all of those. Also pray for me, I'll be staying uh, in the States. I have a couple of exams uh, to pass. Uh, pray for, we have uh, uh, some, uh, some of our graduates in our school of missions. We're actually working in South Korea, but the vision is for him to start up a business and making, um, oh, what do you call it, solariums? Oh, what do you, greenhouses. See, I speak in Polish, my wife reminds me in English. So, um, but he's actually been in North Korea seven times, and there's, he goes in with a ministry actually from the U.S. that have been going in and out of North Korea since the 1990s. So pray for them. Um, and once again, we're so thankful uh, for your faithfulness uh, in, um, to us uh, in supporting and praying for us. So thank you so much.